Now, my sermon this morning is going to be kind of a continuation from last week. If you were here last week, I'll do a real brief recap, but um, you can go online and check the sermon that I preached if you missed it. Last week, I preached a sermon about the Lord being true and faithful and that we could trust his words and rely on his words and that everything that God says, you know, we could we could take it to the bank. Every single thing that comes out of the mouth of God is true. He's faithful to us. You know, no matter what we do, he's faithful with our salvation. When he makes a promise, he's true to his word. So last week I talked all about how God is true, how God is faithful, how God keeps his promises. This morning now we're going to flip around and look at it from us, at our perspective, and, and how we should be faithful. So I've got a whole bunch of, of topics here on how we need to be living a faithful life and how we need to be faithful, faithful to God, faithful in other areas of our life and being dependable. And we see here in Psalm 12, look at verse number 1. Psalm 12 starts off, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. And you know what? We can look at the world today and say the same exact thing from the heart. Help, Lord, the faithful, the godly man sees it. The world is becoming more and more wicked. Our nation, our culture is becoming more and more wicked. It seems like the godly man is really hard to find these days. The faithful fail from among the children of men. And it's so evident in so many ways. Just, just think about that word faithful, right? A faithful means you're, you're dependable. Someone can rely on you. When you say things, people can believe what you say because you're faithful. You're dependable. You can speak and people can trust your word. Not that long ago in this country, there, that, was, that was held much higher and higher esteem and higher regard for people, for men to be men of their words. That when you said something... Even if you said it by accident, even you're going gonna, you're gonna to follow through with it. Even if later on, oh man, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Because you said it, you're going to stay true to your word. These days, it's like people are just lying all the time and they don't even care. People get real flippant about, oh yeah, I said that. Well, I didn't really mean that. And move on. And it's evident, in, for one, in the fact of just seeing how many divorces that we have these days. It is, it is epidemic. Now, there's always been divorce. I, I realize that. There's, there's always been people who have, who have issues and have problems and, and, and go through divorce. But when you see it just skyrocketing, even among Christians, among God's people, right? Because we're supposed to be the faithful of the land. You know, let the world be unfaithful. Let the world be liars. Let the world be deceivers and be wicked. God's people, though, us Christians, we should be faithful. But when you look at the, the divorce rates, and, and what is that ultimately saying? Now, oftentimes we have this concept when we think of marriage, of someone being unfaithful, you think of them committing adultery, which that is a completely proper usage of the word being unfaithful. You, you have not been faithful to your spouse. But I'm going to submit to you this morning that even just getting the divorce is being unfaithful. You're unfaithful to your words and to your promise that you made. When you make that vow and you make that promise, you promise to be with that person until death you do part. Now, unfortunately, our laws are not designed the way that God had ordained them to be designed, to be set up. You know, committing adultery in the Bible is worthy of the death penalty. So if your spouse were to commit adultery, then... The, the, the judgment according to God is that person we put to death. So I know like a lot of people have a hard time dealing with that and, and, and for good reason when your spouse is unfaithful to you, right? The, it, it, it's something that like, I couldn't imagine what that must be like to go through that. And it, it's very, very painful. And God has put and ordained a death penalty on that type of a crime. Now, for one thing, if we had that in place today, I think there'd be a lot less adultery if you were thinking, wow, I could be actually put to death for this. 
We have this, this eroding of the morality in the country, and, and the more people do things, the more acceptable it becomes, and then the more likely people are to do it because you see it going on all around you, it doesn't all of a sudden seem that bad anymore. When you think in your mind of just things that people can do that are worthy of death, those are really bad things, and, and, and we have that you know, program that those are really bad things. Of course they're really bad things. And you would say, I would never do something that's worthy of being put to death. I would never do those things. And part of the reason is because it's been, it's been explained and, and taught that these are really bad things. If we had these laws and these, these you know, it, it was being taught more from the pulpits especially, but just in, in, in society, hey, this is a really bad thing. This is actually so bad it deserves a death penalty. People would view it differently. You wouldn't be quite as likely to, to, to fall into that sin and to allow yourself to, to give in to that desire that, that you might have for another person when you're thinking, you know, this is so bad I can just lose my entire life over this and be put to death. But that's what God has ordained. And see, it's the eroding of the proper punishments and, and so many things. I mean, the devil has been attacking from all fronts that has been causing this to happen. But I'm not going to get into all the causes for this. The point this morning is, is to show that we need to be faithful. We need to be faithful in all things. And I'm going to get to the, to the marriages in a little bit. I'm actually kind of jumping a little bit ahead. But when we see the godly man cease that the faithful fail from among the children of men, that was just evidence in, in one area. But as you deal with people, you'll probably see the same thing. You deal with businesses, you deal with people, and they'll make promises and they'll say, oh yeah, you're going to have this, and all of a sudden you don't get it, and then they don't follow through on their word. And people don't care anymore, to the point to where now you just, I mean, you pretty much can't believe anyone for anything. And when you come across someone who is faithful, when they do say something, they're there, it's an odd thing. It's a strange occurrence. Wow, here's someone who, who actually meant what they said. Here's someone who's a, who's a good friend that, that when, uh, you know, when bad times happen, they're still there. They're still sticking around with you. God is faithful to us. We saw that last week. Even when we're not faithful to him, he remains faithful to us. His promises are sure. We need to make sure that we're doing the same thing. If we're going to be followers of Christ, we need to be faithful to to others, and we need to be faithful in all aspects of our life. Proverbs 25, 13, you don't have to turn there. Well, go ahead and turn to Proverbs if you like. There's a few verses we're going to look at in Proverbs. Proverbs 25, you're in Psalms already. It's just the next book is Proverbs. We got quite a few verses from Proverbs. Proverbs 25, 13. When you're faithful, people can rely on you. Proverbs 25, 13 says, As the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him, for he refresheth the soul of his master. So the meaning might be a little bit lost here. We owe a time of harvest. We're not, you know, most people aren't involved in agriculture, but when you go out and, and, and harvest your, your crops, you know, that's at the end of like fall, right? Or beginning of fall when the end of summer, when, when everything's grown, and you go out to harvest and it's a lot of work, a lot of labor. A little bit of snow is going to help you. It's going to cool you down doing all that hard work. It's refreshing, right, to get that, to get that when, you're, when you're out working super hard. And that's what we see here. It says here at the end of the verse, for he refresheth the soul of his masters. He's likening that, that, that nice, cool snow to, that when you're doing that hard work to someone who's a faithful messenger. Someone who, when you send them with a message... They are faithful and they are going to deliver that message that you have. And again, you know, these days with technology, you're like, what do you need a faithful messenger for? You know, I just pick up my cell phone and, and call whoever I want to call anywhere in the world. And but that tech, this technology hasn't been around for that long. And the way people used to get messages before the digital age and even analog age, electronics and stuff, and being able to, to communicate with people at great distances, You'd have to send somebody, that's, you know, like the post office, you know, used to ride on horses and deliver messages and deliver mail. And being able to, to, to give information is really important. So someone who is a faithful messenger, someone who you could rely on, that 
Regardless of their circumstances, they will deliver and do their job was an important thing to, to be able to rely on somebody for. So if you have really important news, it's going to make a big impact to get that over uh, to this other area. The faithful messenger is someone who refreshes the soul of their master. The person that they're working for can be just comforted and at ease knowing, hey, this person's faithful. I can rely on him. This verse actually kind of reminded me when I read it of our prayer requests. Now, we make these lists of, of people to pray for. And, you know, I talk about it frequently. You know, I bring it up every time we do the announcements. And, um, you know, what you, what you should be asking yourself is, are you actually taking the time and faithfully praying for people? The Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Fervent prayer. It's, it's, it's something that, that you need to be faithful in doing and doing regularly. Think about what would happen if you were in a situation like some of the people that we're praying for today. When we look at our list, and, and you know, we have, we have a, a young man on there that has ALS. We have the other guy that had the intestinal bleeding. And think about, you know, we all go through hard times at one point, at least at one point or another in our life, where we have a really low moment. Now, it's easy to forget about praying. It's easy to just... Because it's, it's, you know, especially when things are going really well in your life. When things are going great for you individually, you're kind of just focused on what's the next thing I got to do, what's the next thing I got to do. And at least I know this is the way it is for me. Maybe you're different. I know this is kind of the way that my life runs. And I think it's probably common among a lot of people. When things are going well, you, you tend to lack some of the communication with God that you need to have and reliance on Him and prayers and um you know, if you don't have prayer as a regular habit in your life where you're taking time out to think about other people and to pray to God and try to intercede for them and, and, and go to God in prayer, you know, when things are going well for you, it's, it's, it's harder to think about other people. But if something like that were to happen to you, this is what we always have to remind ourselves when things are going well. What if that were to happen to me? Wouldn't you want as many people as possible? Like, put yourself in their position. You have, all of a sudden you get diagnosed with cancer or you know you have you have the death of a, of a loved one or you have you know a, a, a debil debilitating disease and you're bleeding and you're in a lot of pain and you're you're in a state where you're helpless wouldn't you want as many people praying for you as possible just just going to God and, and and just praying that God will heal you I mean as much as you would want that we need to have that same mentality of saying, I'm going to pray for that person. I'm going to pray for these people and make sure that I make the time to do this, especially because if I'm in this situation, I'm going to want people doing the same exact thing for me. I mean, how would you feel if your friend, say you knew someone, your, your personal friend, if you were able to know that you're, you know, you're in so much pain and struggling, and you ask them, you know, please pray for me, and then you find out they, just, they never prayed for you once. It'd be heartbreaking. You think, of, do you even really care about me? Right? And we need to remember, hey, we need to care about these people that are on our prayer list and in your lives and everything else. I mean, your spouses, your family, other people. We need to be faithful in our prayer and going to God and, 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 and making these requests. We know that prayer works. We know God has told us, you know, ask and you shall receive. And, and many other times that the, you know, the prayer actually works. It actually does something. And we need to make that time to do those things. Look at verse number 19 there in Proverbs 25. The Bible says, Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. So when somebody's unfaithful, when you need to try to rely on someone who's not proven, who's not faithful at all, you can't depend on them, he's saying, it's like a broken tooth. A broken tooth gives you a lot of pain. You, know, you, go, you go to eat some food and you're like, ah, you, don't even, you don't even want to bite down fully. You have no confidence in chewing your food when you've got a broken tooth because you're, you're wondering, when is that pain going to hit? Same thing with a foot out of joint. You, know, you don't even want to make the next step because you're worried about, about when is the pain going to happen. Well, that's the exact, um, a good analogy or reference to how an unfaithful man is, someone who you can't depend on, you're just waiting for the failure to happen. You're just waiting. Okay, when's it going to screw it up? 
Now, you have to ask yourself the question, are you the type of person that can be relied on? And there's a lot of things that can hinder your ability to be relied on. For example, if you're an alcoholic or you're a drug addict, that is going to severely hamper your ability to be relied on. I'm not going to rely on somebody to do a job for me if I don't even know if they're going to be awake because they were out partying the night before. I don't even know, you know if they're going to be just worried about getting their next fix or if they're going to be clear-headed and be able to do you know, work or, or be able to rely on them to do something. There's plenty of things. Any, any addiction that you have is going to hinder your ability to be faithful because your addiction is going to cause you to do something other than what you're being relied on to do. Right? It makes sense. And that addiction could be anything from alcohol, drugs, what, whatever, gambling, anything. People, people ruin their lives over addictions. And addictions are all focused on you. They're all things that you do to satisfy your own flesh. Having a, a, a mind where you're thinking about others all the time will help you to overcome those addictions because you'll stop thinking about yourself and how can you gratify yourself as opposed to how can you be a benefit unto others. And, and this is at the heart of being faithful is having this type of attitude. Because the most faithful people are going to be the ones that are most concerned about helping that person out. So the person that's relying on you, you're going to have that, that concern of saying, hey, I want, this, I want to help this person out. Whoever it is that's relying on you to do something. And when you think about other people, that's going to make you more faithful as a person in general. When you start putting their needs above your own. And you start thinking, you know what, yeah, this, this is really important. I need, I need to be there for this person. I mean, sometimes there's decisions you have to make where, you know, in, in many examples, where, where someone actually needs you to physically be somewhere. And you have to decide, are you going to be faithful and just, and just drop whatever is going on in your life and just go and, and help that person? I mean, sometimes that decision has to come up. You say, well, but I've got work. I've got, you know, I've got all these other things to do. I have this vacation plan. I can't do it. No. You know, if you're truly going to be faithful to somebody, when they, especially when they're in a time of need, you need to be able to just drop everything and go and help that person because they need it. And for you to be faithful, sometimes that's what it requires. And that's when it's really determined if you truly are a faithful person or not, is when it does get difficult. Anybody can be faithful when it's easy, when it's convenient, when it fits right into your schedule, right? That's not that difficult. The rubber meets the road when it becomes difficult. When you're struggling, you say, oh man, you know, um, how can I help this person? I remember a few years back thinking just personally myself, um, and, and it turned out I didn't even have to end up making this decision, but there's someone that I knew that ended up having cancer, and he didn't have very much money. And I don't have very much money. You're like, I'm not very rich, but I started thinking, I'm like, okay, well, I have this asset that I could sell. I have this thing. Right? That I use and that and it's a part of my life, but I can sell it and it'll help a little bit. And that's when it becomes real. That's when it's like, am I really gonna, you know, am I willing to, to sacrifice and to do things in order to be faithful to this person and to help them out? And especially when it's gonna make a big impact on your life, right? That it wasn't just some small thing. And, you know, I've got debt and all kinds of other things going on in my financial world. So it's not like I'm financially secure. But when you start thinking about these things, it's like, well, what really matters? This person and their health really matters. So I had made a decision. I said, yeah, you know what? I'll just, I'll just sell stuff and, and to help that person out. Now, the situation changed. And I didn't need to ultimately end up going through with that. But that's just something that, that comes to my mind. But everybody has their own situations that come up and, and decisions to be made where, um, and, you know, especially when it comes to like things like money and, and, and material things, all that stuff could be replaced. When people have health problems, though, and other things going on, you know, it's so much more important that you can be faithful to those people than to worry about your own goods, you know, and worry about just, just having a few extra things. Look at Proverbs 18. We're going to see it here about being a faithful friend. Proverbs 18, verse 24, the Bible reads, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, 
And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So if you have friends, the Bible says right here, you, have, you must show yourself friendly. And what does a friend do? You do things for your friend, right? You're, that's, that's one of the reasons you have a friend is to be an encouragement for them. I don't have the exact definition of friend, but it has to be tied up in the fact that, because otherwise, why would you be called a friend if you're not going to be there for that person, right? I mean, it's not someone that you could you just talk to, but when you talk about things, you're there to supposed to be able to help them and to edify them and to, to comfort them, right? Now, look at Proverbs 27. So you must show yourself friendly. If you have friends, you need to make sure that you are being friendly to them. You are being a friend to them by being there when they need you. A faithful friend also is going to be able to say the things that need to be said because you love that person, because you care about that person. Proverbs 27 verse 5 says, Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. It's not fun to be rebuked. Being rebuked means you're being told that you're wrong. You're wrong about that. But the Bible says, you know what? When someone's willing to openly rebuke you, so that's way better than someone secretly loving you. You know, someone loves you, but you have no idea about it because it's just secret. Someone telling you that you're wrong is better why? It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. So the wounds that you receive from a friend is from your friend being faithful. Those are actually faithful. But the kisses of an enemy, you think, well, kisses are better than wounds. Well, not when the kisses are coming from an enemy and the wounds are coming from a friend. When the, when the wounds that you feel, now obviously this isn't talking about, you know, like, like, fit, like your friend just beating you up for no reason. <laughs> it's like, like causing you to have bruises and stuff all over your body. It's referring to that rebuke in the previous verse. Because you know, it could hurt, right? And, and you feel like, oh man, I can't believe they said that to me. But that can, if it's your friend, if it's coming from a friend, a true friend, that, can be, that is a good thing. And you know, we ought not to, I know the, the initial reaction is to, is to be defensive and, and get angry and everything else. But if your friend is doing it for the right reasons, you know, they're rebuking you, it's because they care about you and they want you to see you doing the right thing. And, and that's faithful. Look at Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14, verse 5. Proverbs 14, 5 says, A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. We need to be men of our word. We need to, you know, when you say something, follow through with it and, and have it be true, not, not be just given to telling lies about things. You know, if you if you are known to be someone who's like who tells lies, no, you're you're not you are not faithful by definition. No one's going to be able to trust the things that you say. And as a Christian, think about this, Christian. You lie about things on the job. Maybe you're in sales, and your boss tells you, "Yeah, just you know, say whatever you need to say to get the sale." That's wicked. And you are going to ruin your testimony if you start lying to people about things and then all of a sudden you're going to want to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who is going to trust you? Who is going to trust the things that you say when you're already a known liar? When you utter lies and you're willing to, to tell people something that's false for your own personal gain, well, when you try to give that person the gospel, you try to tell them about Jesus Christ, they're going to be thinking, okay, what's in it for him? He probably just wants me to come and, and be a part of his church and, and get money or something from me. And that's what they're going to be thinking about it instead of saying, oh, here's somebody with integrity and somebody who's honest, who's able to just, I could, I could believe what he says because he's true to his word. Because this guy isn't known for lying. Flip back to chapter 11, Proverbs 11. And a lot of these are still tied in with being a good friend. Right? It goes a little bit above and beyond that, but, but you can still think of these in the context of being a good friend. You know, you're not going to lie. You're going to be able to rebuke someone when it's needed. And um, a faithful person also doesn't share secrets or things that are told in confidence. You know, when you have a friend, you should be able to rely on that person to be able to have a conversation about personal things without having to worry about them going about and just 
spreading it to the world and be able to keep things appropriate and just in and, and, and secret. I mean, when, when, you're, when you have confidence in somebody, you know, you, you oftentimes, you know, sometimes people have problems in their life and they need someone to talk to and it's not something you just want to display to the world. But you need a little bit of help and you need some counsel from, from, from some friends. And you go to them and you, you reveal some of the, 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 heart, you know, the, the thoughts of your heart. And, and maybe something you've done or something, you know, and you're asking for some help. Well, if you're going to be a faithful person or a faithful friend, you're not going to go and then say, hey, you know what so-and-so told me? Look at Proverbs 11, verse number 12. The Bible says, He that is void of wisdom despiseth his neighbor, but a man of understanding holdeth his peace. A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. So he's saying someone who goes around and tells stories, right? They reveal secrets. Someone who's, who's always talking about things and gossiping and, and talking about other people, you can't, you can't trust that person with a secret because they're already known to go about and, and, and tell people about it. And they, they contrast that with someone who has a faithful spirit, someone who has a reliable spirit that you can, you can go to and they're able to conceal the matter and not have to tell everyone else about it. And this is something that's a big problem these days with social media. Anyone who gets online, I mean, people are laying bare these details of their life on Facebook and on, all, on Twitter and on all these other places. They're, they're just saying things that, you know what, they ought not to be said. Personal private matters. And then other people who find out about personal private matters are then just going and displaying it and laying it bare for the world to see. What is wrong with people these days? You know, there's certain things that just, just shouldn't even be talked about. People need to have a little bit more respect and, and respect for privacy. And kids these days are growing up with this and have no concept of privacy. And now they're, they, they get involved in sin and they get involved in shameful things which they don't even probably realize are a shame half the time because no one's teaching them that this stuff is wrong. They're going out and partying and getting drunk and they're getting all these pictures taken and in and, and, and bad situations and now they're going up for the world to see. And they don't even realize, hey, five years later, you're going to be looking for a job and guess what's going to happen? They're going to be looking at your your posts and the things that you've put up on the internet because once you put something online it's there forever you say oh yeah well i deleted it yeah it's there forever there's there are so many sites that go and, and crawl these things and they save it and they put it away and they archive it you put something up online it's there forever you you can't get rid of it you even if you delete it off your own thing you know people think oh i'll just get rid of it but no it's it you can't it's gone you share be careful with the things that you share don't be a tail bearer of your own things either. Just for your own benefit. I mean, do what you want with your own life, but the more you just, just reveal things and just, just lay open every aspect of your life, it's going to come back and haunt you one day. But dead sure, if, you are, if, if it's not yourself, you're talking about other people, don't be a gossiper. I know it's easy to do these days. Have that faithful spirit. Be able to conceal a matter. You don't need to tell everybody about it. We need to be able to respect other people's wishes. I just had someone give me a call yesterday that's planning on moving out here. And they asked that I don't say anything about who you know. It, it's fine that I don't reference who they are because nobody knows who I'm talking about. One other per there's two other people in this room that know who I'm talking about. But... Um, because it was revealed unto them and it was okay by that person for them to know. But I'm not going to just go off and say, oh, yeah, this person, you know, because there's other people that they have to talk to and they want to deal with first before things become public information. You know, eventually it will become public. But I was asked not to say anything, and I won't, and I, and because, you know, I'm going to be faithful to that person. I want them to be able to, to trust me and rely on me. And they can, because I'm not going to say anything, but it's still, it's just, it's one of those things that, that if you want to be a good friend to somebody and you want people to be able to trust in you and you want to be able to help your friends out, don't just, just talk about, about these other people. Because then who, you know, when someone sees you talking about other people, why would you go to them and say, well, I'm not going to tell them anything about my life because they're just going to go and turn around and tell everybody else anyways. 
Proverbs 28. Let's flip to Proverbs, Proverbs 28. I... I have a lot of content here, so I'm going to try to pick up the pace a little bit. And if it flows into this evening, then it flows into this evening, but um, about halfway, okay. Proverbs 28, excuse me, verse number 20. Bob reads, a faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. And this next subtitle of being faithful in our life is being faithful as an employer, as a worker, right? And um, the first point here that we can get is that, you know, we shouldn't be making haste to be rich. That's, that's a foolish thing to do. You know, people go out and buy lotto tickets and, and scratch and wins and everything else. What are you doing? You're trying to cut corners to get a lot of money real quickly. And the Bible says that he that maketh the haste to be rich shall not be innocent. It also could be people that cut corners on the job. And the people that will lie and the people that will do things to try to get a lot of money real fast. As opposed to someone who's faithful. The Bible says, look, if you're a faithful, if you're a hard worker, you're dependable, you're doing your job, you're doing it right, you have integrity. He says, you're going to be blessed. You're going to abound with blessings. It may take some time to get to that point, but you will abound with blessings. He says, but the person that makes haste to be rich, they're not innocent. Uh, turn, if you will, to Colossians chapter 3. We're done in Proverbs. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 22, the Bible reads, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Now, when I say in here servants and masters, you know, in today's vernacular, you think about someone who's an employee and your boss, right? When you're a servant, you have a master, you have someone that you're serving. That's your master. Well, when I go to work, I have a boss, the owner of the company. He's the person I'm serving. He's the one that I'm doing work for that gives, ultimately, it's going to give him the benefit. Now, it benefits me too. I'm getting a paycheck, but I'm doing things. It's his business. It's, it's, it's you know, every, the company belongs to him. So when I do things to, to help the, the efficiency of the company or, you know, to help the company make more money, it's going to help my boss or my master. It says, servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart fearing God. So he's saying, you know, when you're working for somebody, don't do it as, you know, with eye service. Meaning that you're only working really hard when the boss is looking, right? When they see what you're doing, you're just, oh, I'm going to work real hard now because he's looking at me. And then when the boss goes away, you're just sitting back, kicking up not working, you know, not doing anything because you only want to do work when he's looking at you. He's saying, no, you need to do it in singleness of heart. You have to have your heart right, fearing God. Saying that, you know what, whether my boss is looking at me or not, I'm going to do the right thing because I fear God, not just because I fear my boss. If, if you're only fear, you just fear your boss, you fear getting fired. Those are the people who are only going to work hard when, when the boss is looking at them. But when you fear God, you're going to say, you know what, God sees what I'm doing all the time. And God can see the work that I'm doing. I'm going to fear God. That's what it says in verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. This is the way that a Christian should work. To put your heart into your work, give it your all, give it your best, and do it as if you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ personally. Work for Him in that regard. It says in verse 24, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. He's saying that God's going to reward you. You say, yeah, but I don't get paid very much. And you have this attitude, you know, my boss, I get minimum wage and I do so much more work for him. Hey, work like you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ anyways. Don't get this wicked heart and wicked attitude of saying, well, he doesn't pay me enough, so I'm not going to work hard enough for him. That is wicked and that is not the way a Christian ought to work. If you're being wronged by your boss, Maybe you are. I don't know. But you ask anybody, hey, are you making what you should be making? <laughs> I don't know one person that would say, oh, yeah, yeah I, I don't deserve any more. Yeah. Everybody says they deserve more money. Of course you do because you value yourself and, and the work that you do. You say, oh, I, I don't, everybody's underpaid. Everybody's underpaid and overworked. So get over it. <laughs> 
Don't, don't, don't expect that, that, well, I'm not going to work as hard because this is the money I'm getting. No, that's the money that you agreed to work for. So you give them your best. You do the job that you're assigned to do. We need to have the integrity to do what's right in all situations. And not to be blowing off our mouth on things that are going to end up ruining our, our credibility. You know, oftentimes, especially in this economy, people are losing their jobs. They might have had a really good paying job, and now all of a sudden they have to pick up a minimum wage job. They have to pick up just in order to try to make ends meet because, because things have gone down. And again, don't be a good performer because you think you're too good for that job. You know, maybe if you have to, if you have to get a job at McDonald's flipping burgers because you've lost your good paying job and you have to support your family and you just need to get some money somehow, don't, don't go in there and be, a, and be a poor worker. Praise God that you got the job to begin with, that, that, that you're able to still make some money and earn an income. But give it your best. The Bible says in Luke 16, you don't have to turn there. In, um, in Luke 16, the Bible says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. So what, what you're able to prove yourself, if you're able to prove yourself in the smallest of matters, in the smallest of jobs, you're going to be able to prove yourself in the big matters too. But if you can't prove yourself and be faithful in, in the little things, in just the, the small tasks, who's going to trust you to do something bigger? Who's going to say, wow, I mean, I can't even trust you to, to flip a hamburger and, 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 to, and to take money out of right. I can't even trust you to do that. And you want to be manager? And you want, you know, whatever, like whatever the situation is, you, if you can't do the smallest things, if you can't mop a floor, if you can't, if you can't do these things, no one's going to trust you to do anything more. The Bible says, And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Take care for the things that belong to someone else. If someone lends you something, don't be like, oh, yeah, well, that, that's not mine. And then just, just, just be real rough with it and break it and not care. Oh, here you go. Thanks for letting me use it. You know, have respect for the things that other people give you. Be faithful in that which is another man's. And then you'll be able to get your own. I mean, the reason why you're borrowing it to begin with is because you don't have your own. And, um, you know, if you can't be faithful with, with something that's someone else's, who's going to give you that which is your own? The Bible says, and then in Luke 19, 17, the Bible says, And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in, very, in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And this is kind of referring to, you know, Jesus is going to be doling out rewards. You know, if we're faithful with what God has given unto us, He's going to reward us for that. He said, well, you know, I've, I've given you a little bit here and you were very faithful with that. You were dependable. You did the work that I had set out for you to do. Now I'm going to reward you and I'm, and I'm going to bless you. And he says, have thou authority over 10 cities. So what did he do? He gave him a bigger responsibility. I mean, having authority over 10 cities, being in charge of 10 holes, that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty high position of authority. That's something that you need to be dependable in order to manage 10 whole cities worth of people. He says, you know, Jesus is saying, hey, well, you've done that. You've been faithful in that which is little. The small things I've given you, you're very faithful in that. So here you go. We're going we're gonna to up it to the next level. And being faithful, you need to remember this because people have the opposite mindset. When you start thinking that I'm not going to do as good of a job because I'm not getting paid as much. It, you need to have the exact opposite mindset. You need to be thinking, hey, if I'm faithful and doing a really good job, then maybe I will get a better job. Maybe I will get you know, promoted and get my pay increase and everything else when you prove yourself. And that's always the advice I give to people, especially when you're looking for a new job, you're trying to get in a new industry. Take a low price. Don't, you, know, you may know that you're really good at whatever you do. But the person that you're trying to get a job from doesn't know that. Allow yourself to, to be proved, to be tested, to where you can sit, go in and say, hey, you know what? Yeah, I'll take, I'll take a really low wage for now, but let me prove myself to you. Let me show you the work that I can do. Let me show you that I'm faithful, I'm dependable, I'm a hard worker, and then you can give me what's right. And that is a good attitude to have where you can go in and with humility 
be able to start at the bottom, start at that low rung, but show yourself faithful in, in everything that's given to you, and you will be promoted. Guaranteed. Nehemiah 13, 13 says, you don't have to turn there. I've got a bunch of virtues. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. I'll read for you from a couple places here. Nehemiah 13, 13 says, And I made treasurers over the treasuries, Shelemiah the priest, and Zadok the scribe, and of the Levites, Padiah, and next to them was Hanan the son of Zachar, the son of Mananiah, for they were counted faithful, and their office was to distribute unto their brethren. So we see here, Nehemiah is appointing different jobs to people. He's appointing people, you know, treasurers and um, other people to, to, to do certain jobs. And the people he picked were the people who were already counted faithful. The people he already knew can be depended on to do jobs. And now they're getting these, these higher positions of, of a job to do. Why? Because they already had shown that they're, they're faithful and dependable. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So even in, in, in teaching and preaching Jesus Christ, you know, the Bible's giving us this design of saying, hey, you need to be able to teach faithful men to go out and teach others also. That's who, that's who you're looking for. That's who you're looking for to get the bigger jobs is someone who's already proven to be faithful. Now, I went into this quite a bit in the beginning, so I'm going to kind of go over it more quickly now, but I wanted you to see this verse in Hebrews 13 because we need to be faithful to our spouse. You know, we make that vow. And, I'm, and like I said, I went into this quite a bit in the beginning of the sermon. But God likens believers to being the bride of Christ. God refers to believers as being a bride. So he, he brings in this, this uh, you know, understanding of like a marriage, right? The Bible talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And how we're ma being married to Jesus Christ. So that we're like, in, in one sense, in, in the way they want us to understand this, a spouse to Christ. And we know from last week, God remains faithful to us even when we commit you know, a spiritual adultery or spiritual fornication. God keeps his promise to us and says, well, no, I'm going to remain faithful to you. I have saved you because I made a promise. And the promise was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's one of the promises. There's a promise all throughout the Bible of our salvation based on our faith. So the same way that God maintains his faithfulness, we ought to maintain that faithfulness with our spouses. Look at Hebrews 13, verse number 4. The Bible reads, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So, you know, in, in these two verses, he's saying, look, marriage is honorable. He says, whoremongers and adulterers, hey, God's going to judge them, right? You will be judged. You are going to receive punishment for doing those things. But as we saw last week, he's not going to remove, utterly remove his loving kindness from you. You know, we do, have, we do have consequences that we face when we sin and when we do these things. And he says, let your conversation without covetousness. What's covetousness? Desiring something that doesn't belong to you, right? So in the context here of marriage, don't be talking about and looking at and thinking about other people other than your own spouse and coveting after somebody else. Be content with such things that you have. Be happy with what you have, with what God has given you, with the spouse that you have. Be content with that. For he said, hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Take comfort in the fact that even if, if you don't have the, you know, the best marriage, say, look, you know what? I'm going to be faithful to this person. I'm going to be dependable. They might treat me like dirt, but you know, I'm going to be faithful to them. And when you have that type of love and that type of faith, faithfulness, it will make an impact. People can see that. And I know that there's, the world is full of sinners and that, and that there's people that have hard hearts. But for anyone that might be married to someone who has a really hard heart, you know, you just have to do what, what you're responsible for. And, and if you're going to be a faithful person, like God is faithful to us, then... 
you need to be able to make that decision of saying, well, I can't, because I, you can't force anyone else to do anything. But if we do things God's way, you're going to have a lot more likelihood of piercing the stony heart, of softening that hard heart. When you do things God's way and you are being faithful and you are filling your role in that marriage, it's going to be a lot more likely that you will actually get somewhere. Because when you have that humble attitude, um, it, 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 it works it works wonders. But um, we'll leave it at that. Let's continue on here. Uh, turn, if you would, to... Well, stay in Hebrews. Stay in Hebrews. We need to be faithful to our family. I think I'm, I'm going to try to get through all these points because there's only one more page left. We need to be faithful to our family. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5.8, But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Bible says, you know, we're supposed to be taking care of our families. And especially for the man, the head of the household, if he's not going to provide for his household, the Bible says he's worse than an infidel. What's an infidel? An unbeliever. He said, if you don't, if you don't, man, if you don't go out and work and support your family and support your children, you're worse than an infidel. That's bad. You need, you need to be faithful in being able to man up and provide for your family. The Bible says in Mark 7, Jesus Christ was, was speaking with these Pharisees. And, you know, the Pharisees had kind of come up with all their own rules and own laws, and they made the laws of God and the commandments of God of none effect. Basically, they made up their own rules that contradicted God's laws. And they would make excuses for why they can get out of obeying God's commandments. And one of those commandments was, you know, in the Ten Commandments, honor thy father and thy mother, right? Jesus said to the Pharisees in Mark 7, 9, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. So he's bringing up the commandment, right? Honor their father and mother. And Jesus is saying, You guys aren't following that, because you've got your own commandments. I'll keep reading here. Verse 11, he says, But ye say, he said, This is what you say. This is what the commandment, the commandment says, Honor your father and mother. But this is what you say. If a man shall say to his father or mother, it is korban. And he explains what that word korban means. That is to say, a gift. By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. Now, I've gone over this. I've done an entire sermon about this in the past. The word honor, yes, it means respect. But that's not the only meaning for that word honor. The word honor, and I can prove this to you from the Bible, and this is one of the text proofs, is that honoring someone isn't just a mental thing of giving someone respect or a verbal thing of giving someone respect. It's respecting them by taking care of them also. The Bible says honor the widows that are widows indeed. That's not just saying, oh, I, I respect this person who's a widow. In the context of that chapter, it's talking about the church providing for widows who were faithful and everything else. That the church, actually, the church, one of the church's functions is when somebody becomes widowed and they don't have anyone to take care of them, it's the church's responsibility to financially support that person and be able to make sure that they have food on their table. But it gives all the criteria of who a widow is. That's a widow indeed. And in the, in the verse it says, honor widows that are widows indeed. Why honor? Because you're supporting them. The same thing with honoring your father and mother. It's not just a respect thing. Yes, respect is part of it. But part of the respect is when your parents get old, when they're no longer able to work, the children need to be able to honor their parents and now help them. I mean, they spent their life raising you and helping you and feeding you and everything else. Now it is your duty, according to God, that you need to help and provide for them when they are unable to provide for themselves. But what the Pharisees did was they said, well, hey, whatever you get from me, just consider that a gift and thank your lucky stars that I'm giving you anything at all. So they're absolving themselves from the responsibility by just saying, hey, well, yeah, if I happen to do anything for you, you just be very thankful and gracious for that and consider that a gift. A gift is different than your duty, your responsibility. 
gift is just something for free. It's free will. It's, you know, here's a gift. You can have it. But something that's your responsibility, like being worse than an infidel if you don't provide for your own, that's what Jesus is explaining is part of the meaning of honor your father and mother. It says in verse 12, And you suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. We need to make sure that, that our family is important, that we are remaining true and faithful to our family. Be faithful to your church. Hebrews, you're in Hebrews 13, right? Flip back to Hebrews chapter 10. Now, I think you should be faithful to your church, but not just, you know, obviously people move and other things happen and, and maybe, um, you know, heresies end up being preached, but we need to be faithful to God's church, right? And uh, the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We shouldn't be forsaking the assembling. That's what church is. It's the assembling of believers in Christ. We all get together in one place. We read the word of God. We sing psalms unto God and praises unto God. And we also consider one another. We have fellowship one with another. We see how things are going on. We pray for one another. And we provoke one another unto love and to good works. All of these things happen at church. And he's saying don't forsake that assembling. We need to be faithful to church and faithful to coming and, and participating in this. And like I said, I mean, if, if some, some situation happens and you know, someone starts to end up preaching you know, a false gospel or something, yeah, get out of that church, but go to another one. Don't completely forsake the assembling of yourself together with other believers. Go and, and go, that's why I say God's church, you know, a church that, that is doing the work of God that he's going to be pleased with you going to. Also, we, I'm going to go over this very briefly because we went over it last week on Wednesday. Be faithful to the person that led you to Christ. In 1 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 14, the Bible reads, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. So you're saying, look, you don't have many fathers. You know, there's, there's, I'm the one who brought the gospel to you and you got saved by him. He says, you got a lot of teachers. A lot of people out there are teaching and, and, te you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But you've got one father. He says, look, I'm the one that led you to Christ. If you, it, it, if you know that you got saved by a person, then you can, have, you can have confidence that that person's saved. An unsaved person cannot get people saved. But you know what? There's a lot of unsaved people that are teaching and trying to be instructors and in deceiving many. But, you know, the person that led you to Christ, hopefully they're a good example. And that's my next point, is being faithful to the person that you led to Christ. So not only should you be faithful, hey, if someone led you to Christ, you know, be faithful to that person. Have respect unto that. And that's what Paul was saying. Look, be followers of me. I'm the one that led you to Christ. Look at the work that I'm doing. Follow me. I'm the one that led you to Christ. And then, you know, why don't you, why don't you get on board and do the work that I'm doing here? And, and use him as the example. But being faithful to the person that you lead to Christ, someone that you bring about the gospel to, we need to be faithful to them by being an example unto them and by following up with them and, and, and you know, communicating with them and praying for them. Be faithful to that person that you lead to Christ. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7, turn if you would to um, Revelation chapter 2. We're almost done. We're almost done. Revelation chapter 2. I'll probably skip the, the last point here. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 3, 7, For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow. Being faithful to those. And he's talking to the people that he went out and preached the gospel to and got saved. And he's saying, this is how we behaved ourselves so that we could be an example for you to follow. 
We worked, we labored night and day. We, we did all this work and we behaved ourselves properly. We weren't behaving ourselves disorderly, he says, you know, getting in trouble and going out to the bars and doing all this other things. Look, no. We were doing everything so that you can look at us and be like, wow, here's an example of someone who's working hard. Here's someone who's able to work and support themselves with their own hands and preach the gospel and reach the lost and do it all and find the time to do all these things. It's a good example. We need to be faithful to those people that we lead to Christ. One, by being an example, and two, by following up with them, praying for them, and caring about them. Now, finally, obviously... Um, this, this kind of goes without saying, but we need to be faithful to Jesus. In all of these things that we do will show us being faithful to Jesus because these are all things that the Bible tells us to do. All things that God's Word tells us to do. So when we're faithful to our employer, when we're faithful to our family, when we're faithful to our spouse, when we're faithful in all these areas of our life, as we see from Scripture, all of these will encompass us being faithful unto Jesus. Right? But... The point I want to bring out here about being faithful to Jesus is making sure we keep that faith even in times of hardship and trouble and persecution. The Apostle Peter is a, is a good example of, of someone who did not remain faithful when he denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times. If you remember, before Jesus Christ was arrested, he, says that he, he told his disciples, he says, you're all going to forsake me. And Jesus is like, I'm never going to forget you. Like, like, I'm here for you no matter what. You know, I, I'm here to the end. I'm not going to deny you. And he says, you know, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me thrice. You're going to deny me three times before the, even before the, basically before the sun comes up, before you hear the cock crow. No. And that's exactly what happened. In, uh, in Matthew 26, we see Peter's answer. Says, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. And what did he do? It happened. And, and you know, the, 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 the government came out, they, the, the Pharisees, and, and they came out with soldiers and they, they arrested Jesus and everybody ran away and fled. They all forsook Jesus. But Peter didn't want to be far, you know, he, he kind of followed afar off. He still wanted to see what was going to happen. And he got himself in to where he was being tried and where they were bringing all these false accusations against him. But when it came down to it, I mean, Jesus was already arrested and they wanted to put him to death. So you got to imagine there's some fear there. And he kind of, he wanted to be close to Christ, but not too close. Because then when he was confronted about it and they asked him, hey, wait, didn't we see you with him? Aren't you one of his followers? Well, you're from Galilee. It's, you know, the, the word that you're speaking, you sound like you're from that area. Aren't you one of his followers? Nope, not me. And so it got to the point where he began to curse and to swear. He said, I know not the man. So he just, he just goes on this, you know, completely vehemently denying Jesus Christ. And then he remembers the things that, that Jesus said. Jesus looked at him and he went out and he wept bitterly. Now, Oh, I'm not even going to get into that. He didn't lose his salvation, right? He, he did deny Christ, and you can be saved and deny that you are a Christian. Now, you shouldn't do that. It's a horrible thing to do. We shouldn't be ashamed of those things. We should not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. We don't want to be fair-weather Christians, where when things are, it's okay to be called a Christian, then, then yeah, you're going to identify with it. But as soon as there's, there's persecution that's going to come as a result, that you don't mention anything about it. Revelation 2 verse 10 says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. If we're faithful... God's going to reward you for that. If we don't deny Jesus, if we, if we could just remain true and faithful all the way to the end and just say, nope, you could, you could throw me in jail, you can make, cause me to lose my life, but I am going to remain faithful to my Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to remain true unto Him. God will reward you for that and reward you greatly for that. My last point here is being faithful with God's Word. 
Um, we need to be faithful in the sense that the Bible says what it says. There's a lot of preachers out there and teachers that will try to twist Scripture and make it say something it doesn't say. There's a lot of people who want the Bible to say something that it doesn't say because maybe it hits a little bit too close to home. Maybe it's a little bit too rough for you to, to accept. But we need to remain faithful to God's Word and not try to justify our own sin and come up with excuses for why the Bible says certain things and just believe it for what it says. Now, I'll read from you. You don't have to turn there. Um, there's a couple places in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel 2, there's the uh, words being given unto priests, telling the priests to be faithful. But of course, you know, in the New Testament, the Bible says that we're, we're a, a royal priesthood. That you know, the, the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood is done away with. And that we're all priests in Christ. The Bible says in 2 Samuel 2.34, or 1 Samuel 2.34, excuse me, And this shall be a sign unto thee, that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas, in one day they shall die, both of them, and I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do, uh, excuse me, that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. So being faithful, a faithful priest in this sense, is being faithful to the words that God has said. Because Hophni and Phinehas, they were not faithful to God's word. They were faithful to themselves and to their own lusts and to, and to just being wicked and whatever they wanted. They were not faithful to what God wanted. But a faithful person is going to be, is going to do according to that which is in God's heart and in God's mind for you to do. And in Jeremiah 23, the last place we'll look at this morning, Jeremiah 23, verse 25 Bob reads, I have heard what the prophets said, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Jeremiah 23, verse 26. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. We have the same thing today, prophets that lie and just prophesy out of their own heart, out of what they want to say and what they want to believe and what they want to preach and not necessarily what's found in the Bible. He's saying, look, they're lying. They're telling you what they want to tell you. They're telling you what they want to believe, but not what I actually said. The prophet of the Lord is supposed to be preaching God's word. That's why you'll find all throughout the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, right? Thus saith the Lord. Because who are the prophets? They're messengers of God. Who was Moses? Moses was a man that was used to deliver God's words unto the people. He wasn't, he wasn't you know, coming up with his own stuff and saying, well, here's some more rules for you that, that I think we should just be following because we have all these other rules. Here's some more. No. The Bible, God's word is, thus saith the Lord. This is what God said, and I'm delivering that message unto you. But... In Jeremiah's day, we're talking about prophets here. They prophesy lies. They're not saying what God said. Verse 27, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have, gotten, have forgotten my name for Baal. So what the prophets were doing were saying, oh, I had this vision. I had this dream. And, and trying to tell the people that like it was from God. Just like preachers today... They don't always say that they have this dream about something. They'll say, I got a word from the Lord. The Lord told me this. And the Lord told me that. And they'll just, and people will preach entire sermons about that without even cracking open the Bible. Watch out for those people. They can be very slick. They can easily deceive people. Sometimes the things that they're saying sound really good. They usually will sound good. The, the prophets that prophesied lies in Jeremiah's day, they sounded great. They preached peace. Hey, everything's just wonderful. We're not going to go into captivity. Everything is just fine. God's for us. You know, rah, rah, rah. We're doing awesome. But it was a lie. It sounded good. They would say, oh, I had this dream, and God came, and he delivered us, and we, everything was going wonderful. But they were relying on man's word. We can't rely on man's word in the, in the thoughts of the, of, the, of the heart of man. That's why we bring our Bibles with us to church. That's why we, we, we study so much of this word so we can say, no, what did God actually say? Amen. When you hear a preacher saying anything, 
compare that. Is that what God actually says? We need to be faithful to his word. Verse 28 says, The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my words, my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? We need to, to, to deal with God's word faithfully. And I'll tell you this, faithfully means that we're not ripping anything out of context. And this is important, and get this, because this, you, you might not realize you're doing sometimes, but especially when you're giving somebody the gospel. Okay, you may be teaching something that's true, right? You may, you may know, say, you know what, this is true. You know salvation by grace through faith or whatever, but don't use a verse that's ripped out of context completely in order to do that. And say, yeah, but what I'm teaching is true. Yeah, but if that's not really what that verse is talking about, don't use it. You have plenty of verses to choose, choose from to show people that they're sinners, to show people the, the judgment of hell. But if it's not specifically saying what you're saying it does, don't use it. Because what, what's going to happen sometimes is that that person might go back and then read in context like the things that you said and be like, that's not what that verse says. And now you've just shot your credibility. Even though your message, your overall message might have been true, don't rip these verses out of context just to make it fit your belief system. Let the Bible speak for itself and, and read it and understand it for, the, for what it says and, and use it appropriately. Use it faithfully. It's easy to get a concept in your head thinking, I think this is true. Don't make, don't force anything in the Bible to fit your notion. We need to deal with it completely. If it doesn't say it, it doesn't say it. Hey, that's what God said. Let's not twist his words around. Let's be, we need to be faithful in all aspects of our life. Consider the faithfulness that God had towards us, that God has towards us, in all that we do, especially with our salvation. Let's reciprocate that faithfulness to God and to our families and our, and our uh, employees, our bosses, everyone that we deal with. Let's have a faithfulness where people can depend on us and, and someone can say, you know what, there are still some people that have integrity and that can be relied on and counted on in times of need. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your faithfulness to us, dear God. Help us to be strengthened, to be faithful unto others, to do that which is right, especially when times are difficult, dear Lord. And um, we pray that you would please just Allow us to, to know the truth and be faithful with your word and that we wouldn't um, come across as deceptive uh, to anybody that we could use your words faithfully, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.